Would you briefly discuss how genetic engineering differs from traditional techniques for selecting traits we would like? Well, I've touched on some, but, but there are many ways. First, proponents claim that genetic engineering is more precise and predictable than traditional breeding, but actually the reverse has been the case. Uh, genetic engineering is highly imprecise and highly unpredictable in the areas in which it truly counts, and that is those areas that impinge upon food safety, that, that are relevant to food safety. The, what they don't tell you is that actually the insertions of genetic material have been random. They have not been able to control where in the DNA strand the cassettes of inserted genetic and material end up. That's completely ran, been essentially completely random insertional process. And it's very unpredictable because it creates many disruptions, not only localized disruptions to the area of DNA in which these packets wedge, but also disruptions throughout the DNA strand. So a lot of non-localized disruptions too. And also it's been shown that uh, the activity of many other gene, native genes has been disturbed so that their expression can be elevated or depressed or there can be cryptic pathways, metabolic, metabolic pathways that ordinarily are not active within the plant that can be enlivened by genetic engineering, and that's one of the ways in which novel toxins or allergens can be produced because of these ordinarily uh, latent pathways being enlivened. Those risks, again, are not inherent in, in conventional breeding. In conventional breeding, um, the only things that are really less predictable are some of the potential agronomic qualities, but those are not harmful to health. They're just inconvenient, and they can be eliminated through backcrossing or other, other means. So again, there is a, a great deal of deception going on in the way that, these, that the process is being described. Now, besides being disruptive, uh, there's, there's one other way in which there's unpredictability and really potential for disruptiveness, and that is that even when the genetic material, and in most cases it's foreign genetic material, has been inserted, which, and I haven't gone into the, the unnatural ways and forceful ways in which that happens, and you could follow up on that if you want to know it, but even once it's been inserted, that foreign genetic material is not going to function. <laughs> it's going to just sit there, and that's because gene expression is a very tightly regulated process. And most native genes will not express, okay? Most genes, the default condition of most genes is to be inactive for many reasons, but uh, because most genes, genes are in every cell, but, but many genes shouldn't be functioning in that cell, so they never really turn on in that cell. And even those that do, are supposed to function in that cell are usually inactive because their, their products aren't needed. And they're only active when their products are needed, and otherwise they are inactive to conserve energy and also not to create metabolic confusion. Now, the expression of a gene is regulated by an element that comes at the beginning of the gene that is referred to by biologists as a promoter because it promotes expression. And that promoter only begins to uh, enable that gene to activate and to begin to become to transcribed into RNA and then eventually translated into protein by when a promoter receives one or more biochemical signals that activates it, essentially. And those signals are typically very unique to the species involved. So when a foreign gene is inserted into a uh, a highly uh, unrelated, a vastly unrelated uh, organism, it's not going, its promoter is not going to receive the biochemical signals that would activate it. So genetic engineers have had to remove the native promoter, and again, they hardly ever tell you this, and they replace it with a promoter that is going to be guaranteed to stimulate a very high level of expression within that foreign environment. Do you know where they get those promoters? 
from a plant virus, from a, from a species of plant virus that is very adept at infecting a wide range of plants and is skilled at forcing the genetic machinery, the expression machinery of that plant to express the viral genes. So what you have then is, a, is basically a, a very opportunistic, uh, aggressive intruder, promoter, at the, at the head of that uh, foreign gene, forcing, forcing its expression round the clock. And out of, unregulated by the regulatory mechanisms of that plant, and uh, it's a highly unnatural situation. In fact, the FDA scientists said that just the unnatural drain of energy alone could itself create a risk because that can create stress on the plant. And especially if the plant is in environmental stressful conditions, then that it's already being stressed by that unnatural drain on its ener energy that could create problems. Could and you just illustrate that with the example perhaps of the rice that had the sunflower seed DNA put into it so that it's not all uh, abstract? Okay, well, it's a good point that, that uh, Professor Eggers brings up. Um, there was a situation in which genetic engineers thought, okay, um, we want to, I think it was increasing the sulfur content of sunflower seeds, so they wanted, they added some genes from another species to produce more sulfur. But what happened was that basically took sulfur away. There's only so much resource within the plant, so it just basically misdirected uh, sulfur from one biological pathway into another, and so that, uh, that created some deficiencies elsewhere in the plant, and uh, it also, as I remember it, there were some signs that could have, uh, could have related to health risks that, that they felt needed to be followed up on. But it just shows, again, uh, you know, we're dealing with biological systems and with very, very tightly regulated uh, systems. So making, we're not dealing with just a simple mechanical system that, well, we want to make this change, we'll do this, and we'll only get that change and nothing else. There is a great risk of destabilizing the system. And it's very clear that in genetic engineering, there are many ways in which the systems can be destabilized. And in that case of the toxic L-tryptophan, it was, the evidence indicates very strongly that the met metabolism of those bacteria were destabilized, that they were put under stress. There were several different indications that those bacteria were stressed. And they were stressed because they were, the bacteria had been genetically engineered to create more tryptophan, right? Right. The pharmaceutical, or and they were basically being forced industry. to create more L-tryptophan. In fact, the final, there were many versions there were many renditions of those genetically engineered bacteria. Each of them was correlated, according when the evidence was looked at, with earlier signs of the rare disease that caused the epidemic. But it wasn't at a high enough level to be epidemic. But the fourth, I think it was the fifth version of the genetic engineering, really souped up the overproduction. And they, besides also uh, putting that uh, the, the, uh, the new genes, the extra genes in front of native promoters. They added promoters from a uh, pathological, I believe it was a bacteria or a virus, but in any event, a foreign promoter to force hyperproduction of the, of the uh, L-tryptophan. And that version of the bacteria were associated with the epidemic. And so. they were making molecules, not just L-tryptophan, they were making additional molecules, uh, some of which were clearly toxic, which I think this is such a great illustration to, to go back to one of your claims about playing games with information. You mm -hmm. state that the National Academy of Science and the Royal Society have played games with information. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how they've done that? Okay, well, I'll go into more detail on the, the uh, I'll go back to those examples I gave. The National Academy of Science claimed that crossing a, uh, a native, uh, a domesticated variety of potato with a wild variety using traditional conventional breeding had created novel toxin that hadn't been seen in either parent. False statement, okay? And well, actually I might have gone into that enough, but they claimed that any time 
conventional breeding is used, there's a risk of novel toxins. Again, I think I gave enough information showing that is not true. Uh, they also claimed, the National Academy of Science, that, uh, what else did they, they, they claimed, but here's an interesting point, and maybe I should, um, they basically admitted, maybe I won't bring up the chart, but they admitted that they showed in a chart that in most forms of genetically engineering food, there's a much greater risk of unintended consequences than in most forms of traditional breeding, certainly in any form of pollen-based reproduction. Okay? Now, that's rarely admitted. What, what most, what the Royal Society and other proponents claim is there's an equal risk of unintended effects. So the National Academy of Science actually admitted what is, is true, that there's a, uh, an equal, uh, I'm sorry, that, that most of the prevalent forms of creating genetically engineered crops entail a greater risk of unintended consequences. But then they claimed, yes, but the risks are still the same. Now, this is very bizarre. Okay? Now, that's because if we get back the standard scientific definition of risk is the degree of risk equals the probability that harm will be created multiplied times the amount of harm, the degree of harm that is likely to be created. Okay. So therefore, if there's a very low risk that harm will be generated, but the potential harm would be catastrophic, then there's still a significant risk. Conversely, if there's a very great risk that an unintended effect, some harmful effect will be generated, but the harm would in almost every case be minuscule, then it's still a fairly small risk, okay? So, the, so when the Royal, from, I'm sorry, when the National Academy of Science claims you can take, you can take a genetic engineering in one of the most, in ways that is creating a much greater risk of unintended consequences, and it does have a much greater risk of unintended, unintended consequences than just traditional pollen-based breeding, and yet pollen-based breeding is just as risky. The only way the risk of pollen-based breeding could be just as risky is if the average uh, unintended effect is likely to pr produce a much greater damage than the damage created by the unintended effect of genetically, uh, genetic engineering, right? It, is everybody clear on that? It's because it's an inverse relationship. If, if the risk of unintended, if the probability of unintended consequences of genetic engineering is greater than in pollen-based breeding, but the risks are the same, the only way that could be true is if the, the average case of uh, the average unintended effect of pollen-based breeding is far more likely to create great damage than the, uh, the average case of genetic engineering. Well, that's absurd. We know that's not true. And in fact, because that's so absurd, that is an isolated instance. That, in fact, I don't think the National Academy of Science continued to argue that beyond its 2004 report. But there you have it, actually. They told the truth, and yet it's an absurd statement, and they ended up misrepresenting the technical definition of risk. And in doing that, they claimed in that report the same genetic engineering poses the same kinds of risks as traditional breeding. And that is a claim you will hear from the Royal Society and many other proponents. The same kinds of risks. Well, risk isn't about qualitative, it's quantitative. So yes, there could be the same kinds of risks, a remote risk, well, even, as I've stated, a highly remote risk of unintended toxins. But even if we say that there's some minuscule risk, it's a matter of degree, okay? But they hide that. Just give the example and, and then we can move on. If you compare plane travel with automobile travel, not only are there the same kinds of risks in plane travel as in automobile travel, in fact, a lot of the worst, a lot of the greatest risks in plane travel occurs in on the ground, hitting another vehicle on the ground. But there are scarier risks falling out of the air. Yet we know that the, the quantitative risk of flying in a plane is much less than in traveling in a car. So you, it's not a matter of seeing what kinds of risks are involved. 
it's the potential risk, the potential for harm. And by, by the National Academy of Science and the others claiming the same kinds of risks, they are actually surreptitiously misrepresenting the technical, the technical definition of risk because that's not where it's at. It's the degree, the potential degree of harm. It's the degree of risk, not the kind of potential harm. So again, that's all, maybe we can go into that more detail that wasn't clear, but it really is a major uh, misrepresentation of risk and they've been getting away with it. I think in interest of time, if people are interested, they should read that chapter. After I looked at that figure, and then you explain it for several pages and tear it apart, I looked at it and I said, the x-axis makes no sense. It seems reversed. I don't understand why everything is slammed up against the y-axis. Mm -hmm. And like this is one of the worst figures I've ever seen, and it does not make sense. And then I read what you had written about it and uh, tore it apart. And it didn't make questions. sense because it was intentionally not to actually. It was, it was I, I thought that the words in my mind were like, this is bogus. This is a lie intended to deceive people. But I didn't, you know, that was my sense of it. And remember, but, that's from the report of the National Academy of Science that is held up as the gold standard of risk assessment. And it actually misrepresents risk. And it mis just risk in general, and then misrepresents the risks of genetically engineered food. Let, let me go into. Can I, I can I ask? Oh, go did you go into sure, something yeah. else? Yeah, let's. Okay. Although I will say, you know, it's one of the greatest threats to democracy and society to have government agencies that behave in ways that erode our confidence in them. So. Ethically, this is absolutely enormous. And I think we should be holding people accountable, no matter whether they're in industry or government agencies, for this kind of you know, breaking of the law in a, in a profound sense, if not literal. But they are literally doing it too because they're not upholding what they're supposed to be doing. And if we can prove they know that. And let me add, Dee, that it's not just within industry and government agencies. And the National Academy of Science is not really a government agency, although it, it reports to the government. It's supposed to be giving the government, decision makers and the public, you know, objective, sound, scientific advice. And it hasn't been doing that in the case of genetically engineered foods. It has in the case of climate change, climate change and most of the other areas in which it has been writing reports. That's why it's so, uh, dangerous of what's going on in genetically engineered food. Um, and also, because most of the members of the National Academy of Science are university uh, professors or members of, of other scientific institutions, and they hold high positions of high esteem, and high esteem in the scientific community. They should be reliable. We should be able to trust them. But when they are speaking in an official way about genetic engineering, you basically have to carefully scrutinize everything, and it turns out most of what they're saying is not reliable. That is, as you say, that's an ethical, that's why I say it's the biggest issue in bioethics. And uh, it really, people do need to be held accountable. You know, even in, in law, which is a reviled profession, lawyers are had, held to a much higher standards of ethics. If lawyers were violating, in their official appearances of the court, were violating the, the standard, you know, uh, uh, standards of, of really truth telling, the way the National Academy of Sciences and the Royal Society is, they'd be disbarred. <laughs> and yet the scientists are getting away with it. So uh, there really does need to be accountability. I think we need to move on to other parts because there's so much more to cover. But I just want to tell folks that if you were to read that chapter, there's like documented, footnote backed up examples of the FDA flat out lying about what occurred in order to obscure the fact that the tryptophan was the cause. Um, so I highly recommend that chapter. It would make an amazing movie, but we'll just go on from there. Steven, I know that you, you have a lot of issues with the so-called testing that's been done. And I think, Dee, you are going to ask them a question about some of the specifics of that. So, you know, basically, you know, tell us about Arapat Kushte and um, the um, Cerlini papers. I mean, those are two incredibly important um, reports of research that was done, were done by, you know, very respected scientists 
and those scientists really suffered for it. So give us a little bit more background on that. I alluded to those two studies uh, in my opening presentation. I stated they were two very important ones. They are. They're probably, the, in many ways, the two most important single studies. The first one, as he said, was it was conducted at the Rowett Institute in the, in the 1990s under the su supervision of uh, Dr. Arpad Pushtai, uh, who was one of the renowned experts in food safety testing. And his research design, that, that research was basically sponsored by the UK government. And the S Scottish Department of Agriculture had had a call for, for papers for basically designing, it was, it was recognized, as the Royal Society of Canada eventually rec recognized, that there were not any good scientific protocols for even assessing the toxicity or the, other, or the har other harm of genetically engineered crops, and that there had to be better testing protocols than this substantial equivalence rubric, which, which was known not to be rigorous science at all. So they called for, uh, for basically proposed research. And I think they had, they had uh, proposals submitted from over 20 different research groups throughout the world. The proposal submitted by Dr. Pushtai's group won out. So we know it was very solid. Also, it essentially was following the same protocols that he had used in scores of other studies he had conducted that had been published in the peer-reviewed literature. So this was really solid. And the UK government decided to put a lot of its money into this study. Now, it was also presumed that the genetically engineered potatoes that were being produced were going to be very valuable agronomic products. And they felt that it was going to be safe because of, mainly because the foreign protein, the gene for the, to produce the foreign protein, which was in this case a lectin, which was known to be uh, toxic to uh, predators of potatoes, we knew, they knew that from extensive prior st testing, and Pushtai was an expert on lectins, he'd done a lot of the prior testing, that particular lectin was known to be safe for mammals up to very, very high levels. So they knew at the level that a human or, or a farm animal could be consuming, or a laboratory rat would be consuming that lectin should be far lower than they knew was the level needed to create harm. So they figured, good, we're going to have a, a pest-producing uh, potato that won't need to be sprayed, will naturally fend off predators, it'll be safe for humans and farm animals, and we will have demonstrated its safety through rigorous testing. So the Rowan Institute had already, I believe, taken out a patent on it. You know, they thought they could commercialize it. And Dr. Pushtai and his team expected it, fully expected it to be shown to be safe. Their expectations were actually not met because that potato was found to create several statistically significant problems, including suppression of the immune system uh, and many other uh, problems within the laboratory animals. Uh, one of the, among the problems, were very suspicious uh, overgrowth, changes of growth patterns in a section of the small intestine, which, among other things, could be a precursor of cancer. So that in itself was a danger sign, and that part of the study was published in The Lancet. Now, the researchers concluded explicitly in the part of this, in the paper that was published in The Lancet, that because of the, of the way the study was conducted, the problems were essentially, they knew they weren't due to the expression of the lectin. So they concluded it was some more general feature of the genetic engineering process. Well, again, that posed a major, major threat. And because Dr. Pushtai was interviewed by the BBC, who was doing a series about what government scientists at the Rowett Institute were doing, and he mentioned what he had found pre-publication, then that got widely publicized. He was widely attacked by the Royal Society leading the charge, and most people have been confused about that research. Most people think that research was bunk, and many people think it never even got published in any journal, let alone one of the best, The Lancet. My, 
the 10th chapter in my book documents all of the ways in which the facts have been misrepresented and people have been confused. But may no, make no mistake about it, that was a solid study. It has never been refuted, never been refuted, even though there have been claims that it has. One reason it has never been refuted, in fact, the main reason is once once the cat was out of the bag and it was known that those potatoes created problems, the UK government, which had been funding the study, shut it down. There was pressure on the Rowan Institute. He was fired. His wife was fired. They were muzzled. They were forbidden to talk about it. And those potatoes were all destroyed, all the genetically engineered potatoes. Now, every insertion event of a foreign gene is a unique event. So when, with all those potatoes being destroyed, it, mean, it that meant that there could be no further uh, retesting of that because you destroyed all the potatoes. The only way to have retested would have been to take some of those potatoes, that you, those unique insertion events, and retest them. By destroying them, meaningful w retesting was prevented. So, I'm wise, we got to jump to Serini, but I want to throw in something that I just can't resist throwing in right here. With the tryptophan, the FDA went to Japan, toured the plant, said they wanted the organism. The Japanese company said, here, take it. They said, no, mail it to us. Yeah. And well, they refused to get it for six years. Was that right? Yeah. Well, actually, you're almost correct on that. The, the FDA, the, the manufacturer in Japan offered to send the FDA the bacteria so they could, genetically engineer bacteria, so they could, could uh, could study them, but they said, and the FDA said, mail it to us, and, and they said, no, you've got to send somebody over because these bacteria are sensitive. During the flight, things could change, and once you get them, you won't be able to actually do a scientifically reliable study on them. They said, send somebody over. We will describe to him or her how to take care of, of those bacteria on the flight, and how to do subsequent testing. The, the manufacturer was quite willing to be open about it. The FDA never sent anybody, so eventually the manufacturer destroyed the bacteria, Just which is probably what the FDA out. wanted to happen. Well, so that again ruled out the best way to actually find out what had happened, because the FDA refused the opportunity to actually do follow-up testing. I don't know if you're aware, we only have 20 minutes left until 8.30, okay. so, so it might be a good time to actually uh, skip forward and talk about computer science and what Let me just want. first do the Seralini. I can okay. do that in a couple minutes and then we can get into computer science. The Seralini study was the other one I mentioned, the one that tested that widely planted genetically engineered crop, genetically engineered food, and found that the, that the genetically engineered crop was toxic even when unsprayed, the Roundup was toxic even when administered separately. As I mentioned, no there's no uh, requirement to test any genetically engineered food beyond 90 days. And that showed a crop that had passed review based on a 90-day toxicology study was found to be highly toxic when it was tested for a longer term. That basically indicates, that implies that no genetically engineered food on the market can be regarded as safe because none of them have been tested to a long enough, a rigorous enough way. That's why that study has been mercilessly attacked. Uh, Monsanto orchestrated a major attack. Many scientists kept demanding that the, to the journal that they retract it. And finally, it was retracted, but under false pretenses. Uh, it was, uh, they focused the attack on a part of the study that found an unusual a rate of tumor development in the genetically engineered, uh, genetically engineered corn. But it was not a toxic, it was not a carcinogenicity study. It was a toxicology study. And they pretended that it was a flawed carcinogenicity study and that not enough test animals been, had been used to make it a reliable uh, test for carcinogenicity. When they full well knew it was a valid test, for toxicology, and that the toxicology, toxicological uh, results were valid. They pretended it wasn't, and all the attack was directed at the tumor, uh, tumor findings, and when the study was finally retracted, the only reason that was given by the editor-in-chief was that the tumor findings were inconclusive, which isn't a valid reason for retraction anyway, 
and they ignored the valid toxicological findings. And you will find when the Royal Society talks about it or the National Academy of Science talks about it, they again, they continue, they keep alive the pretension, the really falsehood, that it was a flawed study for cancer. It wasn't. But you, will re you could read the reports from all the eminent scientific institutions, and if you didn't know the facts, you would think you would not know it was a valid toxicological study. That, it's deceptive, it's fraud according to our legal system. If they were selling that food and hiding the fact that it had been shown to be toxic in valid studies, that would be fraudulent. They could be not only sued, it's probably criminal, but they're getting away with it in the context of what's supposed to be scientific discourse. Uh, so that's very important to know. Also, because it was a solid study, I think it was at least five different scientific journals offered to republish it, and it did get republished in a respected journal. So again, the Royal Society, when it talks about it, all it does is it mentions it was, it was retracted. It doesn't even mention it was republished. Outright fraudulent. So again, they're acting like spin doctors for industry when they should be acting as scientific organizations. So now we can move on. I hope that as members of the audience, you're getting the idea that based on some of the health effects that we've observed and things, that these organisms are perhaps producing chemicals or engaged in biochemistry that they might not otherwise normally be engaged in, whether the organism itself is affected or the organism ingesting it is affected. We're seeing weird mm. things. That's technical, I like that term. But so, so in computer science, we use the same terminology. Computer scientists have gained a tremendous amount of information about unavoidable risks that occur when we alter complex information systems. And there's a chapter in the book about this, which is interesting, a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. Fortunately, we are very lucky at UNC Asheville to have a professor, assistant professor Brian Dwarart, who specializes in this in the computer science department. And we've asked him to give some comments on this and then participate in answering uh, questions about this highly relevant area. Thank you so much for that introduction, uh, and thank you for letting me be here today. Um, yes, my name is Mark Jarrett, and I'm in the Computer Science Department, and my specialty is not just computer science, but also in computational biology, where we're trying to study and understand how the cell works, so these protein gene interactions are something I'm studying actively in my research. And I'm, what I'm hearing is that what you're really looking for is a, a better level of testing. So, I mean, we all use software every day. I mean, who's got an update on their phone? and their phone isn't quite as usable as it was just before that update. Right? I know Apple rolled out something recently, but that happened to a lot of people. So the level of testing for that software is not as, as much as the level of testing for the software that, say, runs the planes we fly on or uh, major installations like that. That's mission-critical software, and that is a, a much higher level of testing. And what I'm hearing is that you would like the GMO, GM testing to be uh, that level of testing, that level of rigor, rather than the sort of ad hoc rigor that, that if you've seen today. If it's actually, if the testing is to be in line with our best scientific knowledge, rather than ignoring it consistently. But, might I say, just briefly, as my book points out, and then, and then uh, uh, Brian can go into this in more, more detail, and he, fortunately, he's read the chapter 11 of my book called Overlooked Lessons from Computer Science, the subtitle, and that, that's actually the main message. The subtitle is The Inescapable Risks of Altering Complex Information Systems. And as he and I were discussing before we began tonight, computer scientists have learned the hard way through the school of hard knocks that there are inescapable risks of altering complex information systems, even the ones that they themselves develop. So it's learned that when a, a human information system reaches a certain level of size and complexity, there's really no way to revise it without running the risk of unintended side effects. That in making what is presumably a small, precise change to one localized area of the, of the program that is only supposed to have one isolated effect, and by all the best knowledge, it should only have that effect, 
Computer scientists have learned that no, the default presumption is you may have created some one or more disruption in other parts of the system that you cannot predict and that could mess things up. And therefore, as, you know, as, as I mentioned in the chapter and as, as Brian has just noted, in the case of that special class of software called life critical software, which as he said, that's the kind of software that guides an airplane or it governs a, a pacemaker or it governs the operation of an x-ray therapy machine. So if there's a small screw up there at some point, human life can be lost. So the testing for that class of software is extremely rigorous. Here's the kicker. The regulators in the US, Canada, the Europe, in any advanced country, if there is a, a precise revision made in life critical software, even after that software has gone through rigorous testing to be approved for the market, and it does have to go through really rigorous testing before it even gets on the market, they will not accept arguments that the new version is substantially equivalent to the or former one. And if ever there was a case where an argument for substantial equivalent should be accepted, that would be it. You know, the people that wrote the program make one minor change to improve performance. They will not, regulators will not accept arguments of substantial equivalence. They say, we presume you did something that could screw up the system, create loss of human life. You have to put that system through rigorous testing to prove you didn't mess it up. And the level of rigor of that testing is far more rigorous than any genetically engineered food has been required to undergo. And in fact, as my chapter uh, makes the case, each GE food would have to go through the same level of testing as a pharmaceutical drug to even come close to that level of rigor. So that's my basic point on that. I'm gonna open it up to Brian again to amplify or to challenge anything I've said because uh, anyway, I've said a lot, so I want to hear from you now. Um, I, I think the, uh, the, the basic premise of the chapter is the analogy between software and the, the genome of these genetically engineered uh, drugs, and the fact that one small change in software can result in unintended consequences, and the genome is, is at least as complex as the most complex software we have today. So the, the presumption there is that we need to do better to, better job of testing. I think that's, that's okay. the case you're making here. Um, I think I can definitely agree with that. Um, <laughs> and in fact, you said the, that the genome is at least as complicated as software. Actually, I think and hope my, my chapter made the case that actually when we look at the genome and really look at what's happening, it's far bigger and far more complex than even the biggest, most complex example of human-made software, and it's the least understood information system on Earth, you know these. So what we have is genetic engineers are making not just small changes, but very radical uh, changes in many ways to the biggest, most complex, and yet least understood information systems on our planet, and yet claiming that they can presume what they're doing is safe, and that they don't need to test it at all, or if they do, they can test it in a very superficial manner, and yet they also claim that. What they're, that soft, the experience of software engineering actually justifies what they're doing when actually it completely undermines what they're doing. And, and a, a, another point of irony is, as many of you know, the most famous software developer in the world and one of the richest men in the world, Bill Gates, who made his fortune off of software development, is putting a huge amount of his fortune, software-derived fortune, into promoting genetically engineered foods, even though it's violating the basic principles of software engineering. And it may be, I, I, I do believe that Bill and Melinda Gates think what they're doing is good, and they don't understand, and I think they've been misled by many scientists. In fact, many of the scientists in the Bill and Gates, Melinda Gates Foundation have come from Monsanto and other, you know, other institutions pushing genetically engineered foods. But because Bill Gates didn't finish, you know, dropped out of college early. He was real brilliant. I don't know, I'm just saying, I don't even know if he's aware of the distinction between the kind of software Microsoft develops and life critical software and the rigorous kind of testing that's required in it. So he may not even be aware of the, of the requirements, but I would love for him to read the book. I think it would be an eye opener or other prominent 
uh, software developers to read the book. I think it could be a game changer because really it's a great dichotomy. It's, it's uh, between what's going on and as, as we were discussing, you know, software engineers and other engineers, they can't hide their mistakes. If there are mistakes, they come up, programs crash, or planes crash, or buildings come down, or bridges collapse, and you can't hide those, and in fact, engineers try to get at the cause so they can improve. There are always boards of inquiry. The black box on the plane is looked for. If you look at the history of genetic engineering, it's so starkly in contrast to that, not only do they try to hide their accidents, uh, they lie about them. I mean, they, they don't recognize the accidents, they try to cover them up, they refuse to learn from them, and they keep going ahead. Is that quote I read from Michael Antonio, is they absolutely refuse to learn. Here's another reason why I think genetically engineered foods are riskier than the average case of, of of um, human-made life-critical software. If a plane crashes, they're gonna look at it, and if it was a software problem, it will be found very quickly. So only that plane load, or maybe two plane loads go down. I don't think you're gonna get a third plane load before there's a, you, you realize something has to be done. Uh, same way with the bridge collapsing. If a bridge collapses, you find out why, and then you, that adds to our knowledge of bridge engineering. In the case of food, uh, the most dangerous forms, that most toxins, most long-term toxicity or carcinogenicity in food, it's not acute, it's not short-term. Most foodborne dangers are chronic, not acute. Therefore, there could be problems building up that we don't know about. And look at the case of the Serolini testing in the rats. Medium-term testing didn't show the same level of toxic effects and, uh, and tumor growth that the two-year study showed. Well, the two-year means a very long, life, a life, very long span of the life of the rat. So people have been eating genetically engineered food in Canada and the US. It hasn't been labeled. There's been no epidemiological testing. And we know that there is in, there has been increase in many different diseases correlated with the introduction of these foods and the, pest, and the increase of the herbicides they're designed to work with. Correlation is not causation, but we cannot rule out that genetic engineering is causing some of that cancer, some of that Crohn's disease, some of the food allergies. We just don't know. And the problem is there should have been rigorous testing before those foods were allowed on the market. That would have happened in the case of life critical software. I would like to actually formally thank you, allow people who need to leave to leave, if you need to leave at this time, and then we will stick around for more questions. So will everyone please join me in thanking Stephen Drucker.